but no, I am not. Well, it's a shame I started recording, Joe. <laughs> <laughs> well, we'll get to you in a moment. Uh, we'll to, this is James. We'll have to edit Kevin. Joe out of the video. <laughs> uh, I'm not going to waste my time. Um, <laughs> anyways, this is James O'Keefe, Captain of the Massachusetts Pirate Party. Uh, you're listening to uh, Pirate News on Sunday, October 6th. Our topic for today is the five ballot questions. Before we get to those, uh, I'm just going to quickly go through uh, some of the information about voting. Uh, first of all, if you didn't know, the uh, election is, of course, the first Tuesday after the second, the first Tuesday after the first Monday, which uh, is November 5th. Uh, <clears throat> and uh, polls close at 8 p.m. Uh, voter registration deadline is October 26th. And vote by mail application deadline is October 29th. Uh, additionally, um, you can, if you have the choice of voting in person, voting by mail, and, um, well, in person on election day, uh, in person at any early voting sites that your municipality has, and of course, mail in ballots. Um, you can return your mail-in ballot in person uh, to, I guess, the Elections Division or one of the drop boxes by 8 p.m. November 5th. You can uh, put it in domestic mail by 5 p.m. November 8th, but it must be postmarked. Well, okay, I can get to them by 5 p.m. on November 8th, but it must be postmarked on Election Day. Uh, and if you're mailing from outside the United States, uh, it must be postmarked by Election Day, and it can be received by 5 p.m. November 15th, 2024. Uh, in addition to that, if you go to, as you see here, uh, sec.state.ma.us slash division slash elections, uh, there's, and voting information, uh, there's information about voting by mail, uh, actually, here we'll just start here. So there's interesting about you know how you can register to vote, and to do that you can come here. You can also go to www.sec.state.ma.us/slash uppercase o uppercase v uppercase r slash, and you can register to vote. And there's probably a special link for that, but I forget what it is. Um, and strangely enough, it's not the default. So, okay, uh, <clears throat> vote by, so you can register to vote, uh, you know, vote by mail, um, and then there's, there's pages about voting by mail, and there's, you can even track your mail-in ballot uh, to go and see, you know, you fill out this form and it'll tell you what the state of your ballot is. Is it in process? Is it counted? Uh, and so on and so forth. Um, <clears throat> and then additionally, um, uh, okay, so uh, if you're interested in the presidential race, uh, there is the gentleman who claims that, I believe it's, that's the guy, who claims he invented the internet, uh, who's running as an independent with someone I don't know. Uh, De La Cruz and Garcia are running for S Socialism and Liberation Party. Uh, of course, Waltz and Harris, uh, Harris and Waltz are the Democratic nominees. Oliver and Termat are Libertarian. Stein and Caballero Roca, Green Party. And Trump, Vance, Republican. Uh, there's a there's the incumbent, Warren, who's running against the Republican, Deaton. Uh, there are semi-competitive districts and maybe not competitive it's massachusetts after all but there's there's actual uh, there's actually more than one candidate in the first us house district the second uh the eighth and the ninth everything else there's no challenger it's just the incumbent um counselor as well uh and then 
you know, various people uh, running for senator, state senator and state representative. Of course, I will just point out uh, Joe Onorowski is our candidate for the 17th Middlesex. Uh, and then, interestingly enough, there's two candidates for the Workers' Party, this one in Bristol and Norfolk, uh, Senate candidate. And then there's another one, uh, another Bristol candidate, I believe, for state rep uh, for the Workers' Party. And then I didn't see any Libertarians, any Greens, uh, any Socialists. So uh, some unenrolled, as you can see here. Um, so with that, um, I skipped over who else is here. OK, so I've already introduced myself. Who else is here? Well, obviously, you're a candidate for 17th Middlesex District, uh, Joseph Honorowski, me, myself, and I. And uh, I just have to say that, Jamie, thank you for pointing out that I am definitely an active candidate and i will i uh, had a little bit of a stumbling block with some health issues but i will be getting back out there especially as we get closer to the election and i will be out there trying to meet as many people as i can and really uh, i think now we're working on a, a me and jamie earlier today we're working on a mailing to get out to the public or at least in the area that we've already hit so hopefully we can uh make a dent and also on election day i plan on standing outside my personal own uh place where i vote to meet and greet as many of the people in my community as possible um so you know i just want to you know if anything else give give the establishment a bloody nose so um gentlemen Very inspirational, Joe. This is Steve Revelak. I'm, uh, you know, I'm one of the pirates in Arlington, Massachusetts. Good evening. I'm Eli from Lemonster, Massachusetts. Thank you, the three of you, and thank you, folks, for listening to this episode of Pirate News. So uh, our topic is the ballot questions. So the first one is. Question one. This is the state auditors. There we go. State auditors authority to audit the legislature. Um, <clears throat> so uh, this would, if if you voted yes, if if you vote yes, then you would allow the state auditor the authority to audit the legislature. Uh, and no would make no change to the law. Uh, currently. Um, the the legislature can choose whether to have an audit or uh, not have an audit and there's no requirement that a third party uh, audit them to make sure that they are using your tax dollars uh, correctly or well so um, this would change that by allowing the state auditor to have that authority any thoughts before we go to question two? Uh, yes. Um, so I would have to say that the reason why this is probably a little scary is because um, there's a little bit of ambigu ambiguity, if I'm saying that correctly, as to what those powers would be. It's not done by any other state. This would be the first state to do it. It's being introduced by the current auditor in order to grant themselves more authority over the state body. And even that extra authority is only going to get them so far if those those who are in the those who don't want to cooperate don't cooperate. So I think what it's going to do is just cause a lot of headaches, cause a lot of grief, and I can only see this personally as it being weaponized for political dissension. So if the auditor is leaning one way or another to simply go after the people in the body that they don't like. And <clears throat> what I really see it as is um, kind of one of those tools that don't exist 
and then it could potentially be opened up for a floodgate. But there, there is no reigning authority as to who's doing the budget at the same time. So, I'm I'm in favor of it. Um, yeah, you know, in terms of the, the little bit that uh, is showing on, you know, you're seeing on your screen, then this is the the an argument put forth by the proponent um, is that you know Massachusetts does have one of the least transparent legislatures uh, in the country. Um, we're one of, I guess, four uh, states where the legislature is not subject to uh, public records law. They basically exempt exempted themselves in the statute. And you know we there to to the to the extent that, um, you know, I'm not sure what specifically our um, our auditor is interested in auditing, uh, because an auditor doesn't have to do finan just financials. It could be, you know, are they following laws? Are they following rules, et cetera? Um, I, I would I, I I would I would welcome any measure of increased transparency into the function of our state legislature because even for for me who's kind of a, um, a you know a a bit of a policy wonk i find them very difficult to follow uh to that point i do a hundred percent agree that transparency is should be required uh, on the congressional state level and that part i hundred percent agree on I don't think it should be the auditor doing it. I think it just should be open records uh, it, with a difference because I'd rather see the accountability happen from the voting than from the from one individual person with a whole lot of authority. Does that make sense? And also the staff to do it, though. Yeah, and it, it grants a lot of authority to one person and... You know, those who write themselves more more authority, more power, their job is already to deal with the laws and regulations. And if they're spending their time investigating individual congressmen, then they're not doing their previously assigned duties. Um, I don't think they're going to be investigating individual representatives or senators. I think their, their remit would be checking the books for uh the legislature as a whole so I, I mean i personally don't see it as a way of that it, it will be abused but you know uh <clears throat> as 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 has been noted <laughs> you know the the legislature um the 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 courts the legislature and the uh, it, the governor uh are all not subject to public records requests, right? The only state in the union where that is. And um, this would add transparency. And if it gives the auditor more clout and more people want to run for it, great. <laughs> That's my two cents. Joe, do you want to talk about uh, question two? As a matter of fact, I do. So question two is eliminating the MCAT graduation requirement. So this can kind of go either way. Uh, to graduate from public high school in Massachusetts, students need to meet requirements of their local school district and also receive a competency determination from the state. Uh, by far the most common way to get this state sign off is to pass your 10th grade MCAS. Uh, so this question would greatly diminish the state's role in gatekeeping to high school graduation. If it does pass, students would still need to take the, the 10th grade MCAS, but they would no longer need to earn a passing score or other state approval. Instead, Districts would set their own criteria for graduation, informed by state educational standards, but not beholden to any particular state assessment. This shift would empower local school districts, classrooms, teachers, town officials, and individual communities, allowing for more tailored measures and student achievement. Uh, but unfortunately, question two will also make Massachusetts one of the few states without a common graduation. 
graduation standard, allowing separate educational expectations in over 300 school districts across our state. So, um, just some things to note about this. MCAS require rarely prevents students from getting their diploma. Virtually all the students who meet district standards also pass the MCAS or otherwise earn a state competency determination. In a given year, there are several hundred exemptions amounting to less than 1% of high school seniors. Uh, it would dramatically lower the stakes in 10th grade, though, potentially freeing teachers to focus on less test prep and more knowledge and skills that would fall outside the test. And this lets the districts uh, set graduation requirements to make it harder to maintain educational standards. Um, so there'd be less of a state level standard. And so each district would have their own set of standards. Um, Districts with poor or failing graduation rates would be tempted to compensate by lowering expectations. Uh, students with cognitive disabilities and English language learners sometimes struggle with MCAS and it could benefit most of, most of them. What are your thoughts, gentlemen? I mean, question two is the one that I have been the most unsure about. Um, I do not have a background in education, and I do not have kids. Um, so for um, I d it's not one where I necessarily have a lot of skin in the game. One thing so, to... Go ahead. One, one second. I was going to say one thing that sort of um, I've, I have felt informed me a little was the main backer um being the Massachusetts Teachers Association the the te the, the state's teachers union um which means that you know there's to me that may, makes me feel like there is some you know they're the ones who are 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 forced to teach to the tests and you know to me this is the teachers kind of saying that um yeah maybe there's maybe this isn't the best way to do things Coming from a teaching family, I can I can tell you that the MCAS don't actually help you get into college. They don't help you with sk building skill sets that help you for the rest of your life. And most people, it puts a lot of pressure on 10th grade when 10th grade should be preparing you for 11th and 12th, and then 12th being that jumping board into college. Um, so I think a lot of it because a lot of it's just prepping for this test to make sure everyone passes this test. And it doesn't really determine the strength of your character, whereas teachers would rather be focused on teaching. I mean, being a teacher is a huge sacrifice as it is. And, you know, it's a, somebody who's considered to be a professional without the same pay as a professional in most cases. Yeah. Um, and not to say that there aren't teachers that are doing very well for themselves, but the majority of them are doing it because they love doing it, not for the money. And they're held to an incredibly high standard. And a lot of them do it because they absolutely love being teachers. And um, if the teachers are pushing for this, like you said, there's probably good reason for it. Uh, there is a lot of disabled students out there. And the the disabled students are the ones who generally need uh, what we call what is known as IEPs or individual education plans. And this would allow them, a lot of them have to take like a special version of the MCAS that are based on their skills. And this would really just take out that chunk that would really help them. Anyone with a learning disability, anyone with with challenges that they're already on these IEPs, it would really just help them get through that and not have to worry about that, but still get their graduation. Any others? Uh, before we move on, did that explain it to you, Steve? 
Nope, that, that was helpful. Thank you. Steve, would you talk about question three? Sure. So question three is basically uh, would, if if adopted, would grant um, you know rideshare drivers, Uber and Lyft drivers, transportation network transportation network company drivers, uh, the right to form unions and collectively bargain. Um, you know, and basically there's you know labor disputes between they could bargain for benefits for working conditions for wages um and you know this to me just seems like a a, a very a, a very good thing uh the, the law as written you know has various ways of distinguishing um who would qualify to be a you know qualify to be in the, be in be a, a voting member of the, the union, uh, you have to, you know, have made uh, a certain number of trips in the last quarter and, you know, be um, in the, you know, the upper 50% of uh, drivers in terms of uh, the number of trips shared. But I'm, you know, I'm, comp I, I support uh, workers' right to uh, collectively bargain, uh, and especially in, you know, in, there have been, there have been a lot of efforts over, you know, going over the past few years of, you know, are, are these, you know, are these workers, do they get benefits, are they independent contractors? And, you know, I, I think that um, so far, a lot of the, you know, these, the gig economy workers have really been at the mercy of, you know, who's running the, you know, of the people that they are work working for or the people, you know, contracting the work out to them. Um, so, yeah, I'm, I'm supportive. I, I'm, I'm all for this. Thoughts? I would have to say that I think a lot of the rideshare drivers and like you said, the gig the gig economy, which is what a lot of people are finding themselves forced into these days, um, especially if you have any entrepreneurial spirit in you, you completely are at the mercy of these big corporate tech giants, and they are just raking in the money while barely sharing any of it with the people actually doing the work. And I think that a big part, especially with the ride shares, where you're taking the cost of the vehicle unto yourself, and then long hours, insane hours. Um, it, it's really one of these things that um, they absolutely need to unionize in order to take back some of their rights. And I think that a big part of that too is that's going to open the gate for all gig workers across all the platforms, uh, from cutting lawns to everything. And I think that it's 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 time. It's time to support the people who are working in Massachusetts. And I will just add that, you know, of the uh, the people who are endorsing this, uh, we have uh, representative U.S. representatives Jim McGovern and Ayanna Presley, our Attorney General Andrea Campbell, um, you know, the a couple of the SEIU branches and uh, a couple of other organizations. There hasn't been any sort of uh, campaign opposing th question three, uh, except of course from Uber, Uber and Lyft uh, themselves. Yeah, I mean the one thing I'll add for the the against is I feel like a lot of these are are cherry picked. Like the base $32.50 per hour with yearly increases. I mean, we already know that, um, you know, Uber has, first of all, Uber is not profitable. <laughs> let's, let's not, Uber and Lyft are just not profitable companies. But because of that, they have been attempting to um, raise prices on customers and lower how much they have to pay the workers who are driving people around. And so when they say, oh, base of $32.50 per hour, are they including the fact that they have to pay for their own health insurance? Are they including that they have to maintain their own car, that they have to pay gas, 
that essentially most of the costs of the transportation, i.e. not the app, are borne by the employees. And so a 30, you know, to, to state that it's, they get $32 and 50 cents per hour minimum is just fantasy. They get a fraction of that, um, which is already disingenuous. Um, but yeah, I mean, I'll just say, you know, workers have the right to organize and uh, unprofitable companies that are, you know, break it till you make it um, shouldn't be going dictating that uh, workers can't organize. So, I mean, there was a time I was working on one that I remained nameless and I'd work for like 14, 16 hours a day and only bring in about a hundred bucks. So yeah, th they need to unionize. Joe, you want to tell us about question four? Oh my God, I so do. Uh, that I have been following with keen interest for quite a while now. And is the legalization of psychedelic drugs. After decades in the medical shadows, psychedelic drugs are increasingly being used in clinical research, mental health treatment, and self-care. Uh, it is time for Massachusetts to legalize some of the psychedelics and set clear rules for therapeutic and personal use. This is the choice at the heart of question four on November's ballot. Question four would allow a group of naturally occurring psychedelics, uh, psycho cell, uh, psilocybin, etc., mescaline, DMT, uh, to be grown and shared, used at home, and offered by licensed professionals in a more clinical setting. So, the shrooms, basically magic mushrooms, um, show a lot of promise. There's been some studies done on it already for serious mental health conditions, including people who are terminally ill. Uh, they, I, there was a study done where they used it on uh, stage four terminally ill, actively dying cancer patients, and it just really helped them. But I've known personally on a whole host of, uh, on a personal level, I've known people who were in really dark places and they have used these drugs and have completely turned their life around. Um, psychedelics have been used for hundreds of years by native tribes and by uh, all across the world. Um, so th there's a lot of science that's still being done about this, but it shows a lot of promise. And by legalizing it, not only will we be following Colorado's footsteps, but we'll also be opening the doors for real research and personal use for people on something that's naturally occurring. Now, are we talking about some of the heavier stuff that's class A substances? No, we're talking about the natural stuff. Um, and, you know, it's... Uh, the treatment of psychedelic therapy centers would likely be expensive. So it would be more encouraged for at home use and personal use, um, which will bring some risk to it, you know, but uh, I think, I'm sorry, Oregon was also one of the people who legalized it. Um, but I think a big part of this too, is that the therapy centers would most likely be, one of the downsides is the therapy centers would be more expensive. And so um, doing the science behind it will take time and will cost more money. So it's really kind of would be more of a Wild West scenario. Thoughts, guys? No, it's to me. Uh, question four seems like a, another step in the war on the war on drugs. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, I, I sorry, I couldn't help. I couldn't help but slip that in. Um, I, 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 I'm in favor of it. Um, I mean, this is you know one area where I've 
I'm probably a little bit on the, you know, tend to be a little libertarian and it's, you know, if you're doing something and it doesn't hurt anybody else, it's probably okay. <laughs> I mean, yeah, to add to that point. Sorry, go ahead. Sorry, go ahead, Jimmy. No, you go. No, 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 you go. No, you go. I was just, thank you. I was just going to say that, you know, it legalization and decriminalization is already in our our platform. So uh, this just is right up our alley. <laughs> well, I, one of the things about it, too, is it's already proven that it's it's done a lot of good, especially for those who are having a lot of anxiety there there's a thing in in this particular genre called microdosing which is instead of taking a large dose in order to mess you up if you take a series of really small doses so you don't lose control of yourself but you just have that subtle effect it it's been proven that it does a lot of good so this is a particular case where on a therapeutic level it might help people with a lot of anxiety and a lot of mental issues. And uh, I think it just opens up the gate for us to use something at hand in order to help with the, on the mental health crisis. And I think that would be a really solid thing. Thanks. And so the last uh, yeah, question, I, sorry, go on. Uh, I, I was going to say, I, throwing uh just um using ballotpedia is one of the things i like about ballotpedia is they they basically tell uh they list organizations uh, opposing these questions and uh one supporting them uh the opposition what I, I thought the opposition statement to question four uh from the coalition of safe communities was sort of funny it starts off with we're not opposed <laughs> but but we are opposed so <laughs> i uh i hear this sort of thing a lot in you know in local politics this you know pol political discussions at town levels the idea that well we're not opposed to this thing we just oppose it um and it's sort of humorous to see it there too but anyway that's a digression i'll and uh, please let's move on to question five thanks steve so Eli, would you some would you talk about uh, question five, please? Yeah. All right. Um, so question five would gradually increase um, the minimum wage for tipped employees. In short, um, in Massachusetts, there are currently two different types of minimum wage. There's 15, which is standard across the board, uh, and then for any jobs that have tips, so most like restaurant jobs, uh, it would it is currently sitting at 6.75 an hour. Uh, so a vote in favor would gradually increase the 675 up to 15 in what looks like about five years. Um, and a vote no would keep it the current way, where there's two different levels to it, I guess. So the one thing that I will note is, I, I don't know if it's just the pandemic or just the cash register apps people have been using, but they always seem to ask for a tip. And so if if the folks at your grocery, um, you know, a non-restaurant business are, are asking for a tip and getting tipped wages and also getting at least a higher minimum wage, then why should we pay restaurant employees for example less money i mean if if someone goes and cleans your hotel room they get tips but they're paid at least the higher minimum wage the non-tipped minimum wage so it's just an anachronism for people not you know for people for for company for you know, for businesses with these sub minimum wages to have less labor expenses and just seems ultimately wrong. So the, the plus on it is that they should be making a living wage. 
So it would not just be wait staff, but like bartenders, manicurists, and pretty much everyone else who falls under the tipped ones. The downside to this passing would be then businesses would be allowed to pool the tips and then cooks would be getting some of that tip money. Uh, the bookkeepers would be getting some of that tip money, etc. So there could be some restaurants that pool their tips, but that doesn't really seem like much of a downside because then the cooks are getting some tip money too. So I see this as an absolute win that this passes. Uh, interesting tidbit. Um, there, you know, according to Ballotpedia so far, um, there's been two million dollars spent on this particular measure, <laughs> about a million uh, opposing and about a million um, in favor of it. So, uh, <laughs> you know, there's there's uh, in the like one of the um, like the apparently one of the committee to protect tips. Uh, their main donor is the Massachusetts Restaurant Association. Ka-ching. Wait, wait, to protect tips? And is in say no to this ballot and not pay wait staff proper wages? Yes, committee to protect tips is a, is an opposition um group or an opposite i guess you could call i don't know if they're I, presumably they're a, a ballot question pack or you know whatever the categorization uh is for that sort of thing but um yeah it's uh they've uh they've taken in a million bucks and spent about a million bucks interesting any other thoughts Corruption is obvious sometimes when you can see the numbers. You know, the one place where I, I do give Massachusetts some credit is uh, in terms of campaign finance laws. Uh, we we have good ones uh, in the sense that, you know, there's any the groups doing you know, people running for office or lobbying on ballot questions. Um, you know, do have to file financial reports. Uh, they are audited and, um, you know, the information is pretty accessible from the uh, Office of Campaign and Political Finance's website. Uh, so kudos, kudos to OCPF, my favorite state, uh, state organization. <laughs> and you too can find them and their ample records at OCPF.us. Uh, um, Any other thoughts on the ballot questions? Yes, uh, definitely go out and vote and make sure that you are educated on these so that you can make up your mind for yourself. Um, being an educated voter is probably the most powerful tool that any of us could be. So, you know, um, don't necessarily take our word for it. Uh, get out there, get that information and make an informed decision. Thanks, Joe. Uh, and with that, we'll put links in the description to all the documents that uh, we talked about. Um, so you can go and look for them yourself. Um, find the, you know, find where you can register, <clears throat> you know, where you can register to vote or where you're voting, where your polling places and all of that. Uh, just as a reminder, we uh, will be at the Boston Anarchist Book Fair on October 19th and 20th. We'll have a table with warrantless.org, um, Restore the Fourth, uh, <clears throat> and um, Digital Fourth, as they're called in Massachusetts. So uh, if you would like to help us table, there'll be a link below, and uh, you can just click on that and fill it out and we'd love to have you uh, join us it's a good portion of two days so uh with that thank you eli thank you joe thank you steve and thank you for uh you folks out there listening to this we hope you found it informative and as always you can find us at masspirates.org 
and you know all the click bells and stuff all right with that have a wonderful week bye